for those of you who are visiting us and are not familiar with our church building, this is the Welcome Centre. And so I welcome you and I hope that when the lockdown is over, I can welcome you in person. So today I'm going to be preaching on Ephesians chapter 2 verses 1 to 10. And my sermon title is, But God by His Grace. What does grace mean? This word grace is one that we Christians use a lot and is hopefully something we show a lot of as well. When you hear the word grace, what comes to mind? Maybe food, that prayer you say before you eat. Maybe you think of another prayer, a prayer we as a church often say at the end of our church services together. One you're expected to know the words to, but many of us don't. Hayden. Grace can mean a number of things. And the word grace in our passage today is talking about the way God responds to us as people who have sinned. One definition I found of grace is this. It is the unmerited divine assistance given to humans. Right, what does that mean? Justin Welby, the Archbishop of Canterbury, puts it like this. And you will have heard myself and other people say this a number of times. He says, grace is the most beautiful word in the language of God. It means love given freely and without expectation of return. Love given freely and without expectation of return. Earlier in the week, I asked Jill, one of our children and youth workers, to think of a story where Jesus shows grace. And she chose the story we looked at last week, which is where Jesus appears to his disciples on a beach after his resurrection, one of whom was Simon Peter. Before Jesus was crucified, Peter denied knowing him three times because he was scared of getting hurt or abused or maybe even killed. Jesus on the beach, after sharing barbecued fish with his disciples, pulled Peter to one side and he asked him three times, do you love me? Simon Peter breaks down in floods of tears because Jesus is confronting him about the time that he denied him. But as always, Jesus doesn't condemn Simon Peter. He forgives him and gives him the job he said he would before all of this happened. The job he said he'd give him before he denied him. He didn't go back on his word. He didn't say, well, that's it. I'm done with you now. I can no longer use you anymore. No, Jesus reinstates Peter. He brushes him down, lifts his head off the ground and reassures him that he still has a job for him to do. Feed my sheep. Grace is love freely given and without expectation of return. Grace in our passage today is talking about the way God responds to us as people who have sinned. Verse 8 and 9 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. Saved from what? Saved from death, saved from our sin, saved from hell, saved from separation from God into new life, new hope, new joy and a relationship with a loving and everlasting God. Now I've often followed up Justin Welby's description of grace with my own words. He says it's the most beautiful word in the language of God. And after agreeing, I add that it's also the most offensive because grace offends our pride. What do you mean I can't earn God's love? What do you mean I can't earn salvation? 
What do you mean I am not in control? There are some of you today who have not given your life to Jesus. And one of the reasons you haven't is because you don't think you're good enough. You've always thought that to become a Christian, you need to be a good person. Other major religions teach similar things. That if you're good, if you follow the rules, God will let you into heaven. God will forgive your sins. This is how some of the Jews in Jesus' day thought, namely the Pharisees. These were the religious leaders of the time. And they thought it was all about being the most religious. And they took great pride in their piety, great pride in how upstanding they were. And they looked down on others who weren't as religious and as good as they were. So much so that when they saw Jesus, who was perfect, eating with sinners and tax collectors, the people they looked down upon, the people they thought weren't good enough for them and so weren't good enough for God, they asked Jesus' disciples, why does he eat with these sinners? If he was a righteous man, he would know that these people are not righteous and he wouldn't eat with them. Jesus overhears this question and so he says in return, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but the sinner. In other words, you clearly don't need me because you're looking to save yourself with your good works and your righteousness. I have come for those who accept that they are sinners and in need of a saviour. Those are the ones I'm interested in. The ones who have the humility to receive my forgiveness and the free gift of salvation. The ones who will put their faith in me and my goodness, not in themselves or in anything else. And so not becoming a Christian because you're not good enough is like not going to the hospital because you're not well enough. You don't wait to get better before you go to the hospital. You go to the hospital to get better. Likewise, Jesus is saying that we are spiritually sick. And so you don't wait to get better before coming to Jesus. You come to Jesus and he'll make you better. You don't come because you're good enough. Don't wait until then or you'll never come. You come because you're not. Elsewhere, we're described as being spiritually lost. You don't need to wait until you find yourself before coming to Jesus. Come to Jesus and you'll be found. I just need to find myself, I hear people say. Come to the one who knew you before the foundation of the world. Come to the one who created you and he'll tell you who you are. He'll tell you why you're here. In this passage, we're described as being spiritually dead. Dead people can't raise themselves. We need someone to call us out of our tombs, like Lazarus. Jesus will awaken you. Jesus said he came that we may have life to the full. If you haven't given your life to Jesus, if you haven't accepted his forgiveness and the new life he has to offer, then today could be the day. Don't wander like a lost sheep anymore. Listen to the voice of the good shepherd who is calling you to give your life to him today. Calling you to turn back to him, leaving your old ways behind you. He is gracious. He is merciful. He is loving. He is kind. And so if you're listening today and you haven't given your life to Jesus and you want to, or maybe you have a few questions, that's fine. Send us an email, address it to me, Simeon, and either I or one of the pastoral team will get in touch and we'll have a chat. We want to hear from you. The email address will be attached at the end of this video. And the same goes for you if maybe you've gone astray. 
Maybe you feel too ashamed to come back to Jesus. Remember how he treated Peter on the beach. He won't condemn you. He still loves you and has a plan for you. He can still use you for his glory. Come home. The father waits with open arms and so do we. Now that might have sounded like a more evangelistic talk. But what a comfort that is for those of us who are in Christ Jesus and have been for some time. To be reminded that Jesus is our great physician, our good shepherd, our saviour. That we are recipients of his grace and have had the privilege of enjoying the riches of a relationship with him for as long as we have. Let us not take for granted the faith we have in our Lord Jesus. Let's give thanks to the Father. Thanks and praise for the gift of faith and knowledge of him. Because nothing compares. Nothing compares in this world or in all eternity. Nothing compares with the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus. But God by his grace. That is our sermon title and I've arguably left the best bit until last. Such a beautiful bit of scripture that fills me with so much gratitude. Paul in verses 1 to 3 outlines how hopeless we are without Jesus. How hopeless we are. How dire a situation we were in before Jesus. Until... It says, and you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind. And we were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. But God, but God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us. But God, but God intervened, but God made a way, but God so loved us, but God is our saviour. But God is our refuge and our strength. But God is worthy of our praise. But God is the source of all joy and peace. But God is the truth in a world that teaches there is no such truth. But God and no other God. But God, not I. And so, if you find yourself today walking down a road of sin in search of love, life and happiness, but God. If you find yourself today walking down a road of despair, thinking there is no hope, there is no help, there is no point, but God. And if you find yourself today living in guilt and shame from past mistakes, but God. But God is merciful, but God is loving, but God is gracious, but God is kind, but God, by his grace, saved us. Thank you, Jesus. Amen.